Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope that everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names added to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24 seven during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names of the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service, we're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those who are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to uh, another online service. As always, if you guys missed the major announcements, please feel free to rewind and catch those. Um, remember, send any prayer requests, praise reports, or names to add to our list to cljcrequests at gmail.com. We try to monitor that account pretty regularly. Um, but if you guys see a name that you've requested to be on there, or you don't see that it's on there, please let us know and, and we'll get that situation fixed. Uh, we ask that you guys continue to pray and fast for Zach Carter, uh, as well as Weston. He's the, the young child who's battling leukemia. Uh, today, we're not going to be using the Sunday school lesson. I apologize to y'all if you, you went ahead uh, and read that. But if you did read it, you'll see that it covers a whole lot of material that uh, Brother Thomas has covered over the past 28, 29 weeks through Acts. Um, and this quarter kind of hops around. It's a little strange. It does some stuff with Daniel, but then it, it misses some highlights like the fiery furnace and the lion's den, and it, it jumps to Acts, and then it jumps back to, to Nehemiah. So since Thomas has covered all that, we're going to try to pick up where we left off uh, last week. So you guys have any questions about Acts, you need to know anything about Acts, there's 28, 29 lessons on YouTube and Facebook right now where you can find everything you need to know about that. Uh, if you guys could turn your Bibles, just got a bit of lengthy scriptures this morning to open up with, or this evening, excuse me, as uh, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, and verses 16 through 17. Daniel 6, 1 through 10, and verses 16 through 17. And it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom a hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a statute to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went to his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. And verses 16 through 17. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions, and now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Today I'd simply like to title this, Into the Lion's Den. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you, God. We thank you, God. We praise you, God. We thank you for your word, your mercy, your grace, your blessings. Thank you for everything you've done for our church, for keeping cancer out of the church, our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, and all our children. Just thank you so much for everything you've done, God. We're not worthy of everything you've done, God. I uh, ask you, Lord, to bless this lesson today. Let it go out. Let someone's life be changed. Let someone's hearts be pricked, as the pastor talked about on, on Sunday, God. We don't know who we're reaching, God. Let us reach out, God. We can reach people in Africa. We can reach people in our own county, in our own backyards. God, let someone see this. Let their lives be turned around. Let them turn to you, God. God, and let your people see that, God, when it comes time to be in the lion's den, that you are going to be with them no matter what happens. God, we ask you to bless our nations, bless our leaders, bless our president and his family and our governor and his family and all those that are suffering from this virus, God, and bring peace to this nation. God, touch all those that are that are on the front lines of this, God, the EMT workers, the firefighters, the police officers, all of them, God, that you can reach down and touch them and heal them and comfort them, God, and take away this virus. God, speak that word of healing, God. Do whatever it takes so we can come back into your house again, God. We thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
as Brother Dwayne likes to say, you can be seated. So, I'm sorry, may be seated. Thank you, Brother Thomas. Uh, back in March, um, before the coronavirus hit, and I know that seems like so many moons ago, uh, the Lord gave me a lesson It was called Prepared for battle. And in that lesson, I mentioned the Spartans of ancient Greece, some of history's most famous warriors. All their lives, all they did was train and prepare for battle from a young age where they were sent away from their homes to train in academies to, to late in adulthood where they continued to train and fight. But eventually the time would come they would actually have to be called in to battle. They would have to put all that preparation into use. The name Sparta brought fear to many of those around him. Not even Alexander the Great himself would dare invade the city-state of Sparta. Their cities had no walls around them. Many people thought there were safety in walls at that time, but not the Spartans. It was said at that time that their walls were not made of brick and mortar, but it was made by a wall of men. Their enemies and allies alike both saw their skills on the battlefield and knew the Spartans always meant business because they put into action everything that they had trained their lives for. And had they simply spent all their lives preparing and training but never fighting a single battle, no one would have known their power. No one would have known their prowess on the battlefield. History itself would probably be very different today had they never fought a battle. Their last stand at Thermopylae, you know, it's often mentioned about the, the 300 Spartans and their thousand or so allies that were with them. It helped delay the Persians enough that they would go up and set uh, a decisive naval victory that would help defeat the Persians, that would help keep the Greek city-states safe. Democracy as we know it was saved during that time because had the Persians invaded Athens, what was known as the birthplace of democracy as we know democracy today could have easily been overrun and taken and that could have been stamped out. And like I said, history could have been very different today. When it came time to fight, they were there and they were ready to fight and ready to make they're saying, and that's supposed to be us as well. We spend our lives preparing day after day to fight the enemy. But when a showdown takes place, we have to be ready for a fight. Whenever, whatever trouble or trial comes, we have to be ready. We have to be willing to stand. Now, sometimes God will step in and he'll fight our battles for us. And sometimes, like with Daniel, he shuts the mouths of the lions. But then there's times that we have to do the fighting ourselves. God is still with us but we actually have to get in there and do some of the work ourselves. A lion is often a, a representation of something evil or, or an enemy to us. We know that from 1 Peter 5 and 8, and it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. There are many lions that you'll have to come face to face with. And when it comes time when you're tossed into the lion's den or you meet that lion out there somewhere in the woods or in the field, will you be ready to do whatever it takes to defeat that thing? Will you be able to stand up to it? For the past few weeks, we've talked about holiness and righteousness and how to live our lives as holy before God because he's commanded us to be holy like he is holy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And how to properly serve God. And to me, um, what I'm talking about here, it, it just goes to show me again how awesome God is, um, and he's done this several times over the past six months, and you guys heard us mention it but before, but we get a timely message for that week, and, and it's a good word from the Lord, but then a few weeks later, we see that it was actually, as well as a timely message, that it was a, a piece to a puzzle or to a picture that God was trying to give us much later on, and a few weeks later, it, all the lessons come together, and God gives us an even greater point. He shows us what that big picture was so we know how to live and we know what to do to be holy and now we see that that's all in preparation for battles that are to come that we need to, how to help us be able to stand when that lion comes in our life daniel did not go into that lion's den unprepared you send pretty much any other israelite at that time it would have been a very different and very much gruesome so my money is on the king being very sick when he opened up that lion's den the next morning. But Daniel continued to pray and walk with God, no matter what, even in the face of opposition. Last week, the lesson was on uh, Belshazzar's feast when the Babylonians drank from the temple 
vessels, how they took the holy things of God and they used them as common things and they used them to bless all of their false gods. And then God begins to write on the wall and Daniel comes in and interprets that message of how Belshazzar's days are now numbered and his kingdom is going to be taken away from him and it's going to be divided from him. He's rebelled for far too long. Now judgment is coming. And that night he was assassinated. But before his death, he promoted Daniel to being third ruler of the kingdom. He now has a high rank and he's a chief counselor. He was a true embodiment of First Peter 5 and 6 where it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. But you guys already know from the, the earlier scriptures that not everyone was really excited for Daniel. Not everyone was giving him a pat on the back or saying, go get him, Daniel. You're, you're the big dog now. Not everybody was happy about that. Some began to plot against him. But the thing is, there was a few rules that these people did not comprehend. And the first one was, you don't touch God's anointed and you don't do his prophets any harm. And the second thing was, when God promotes you, when God exalts you, the world can't tear you down. Like that song says, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. So when God promotes you, no matter what weapon comes up against you, it ain't going to prosper. Right. And they can try all they want, like I said, but it's never going to prosper. Daniel is the number three man in the kingdom. Imagine how it would be for you one day if, if all of a sudden you were uh, made third in line for this country. You became the speaker of the House of Representatives. You are now the third person in the uh, line of succession for the presidency. We'd probably get a big head. And I know y'all are thinking, Jonathan, there's no way your head could get any bigger. But if I was the number three man in the whole country, I bet it could. Yeah. We would become boastful and we would let that absolute power begin to corrupt us. And we'd probably just get completely sucked in. But that wasn't Daniel. The Bible said that he had an excellent spirit about him. Uh, his enemies began to break out the magnifying glass. They began to look him over, hoping to find some sort of flaw in Daniel's life. And they examined to find if he was breaking any of the king's laws or any law of the kingdom at that time, breaking any of the king's commandments. Yet they found no fault with him. And because he was faithful, he, you know, and even on a personal level, not, not what he was doing in the kingdom, but even in himself, it says they found no fault and they found no error in Daniel. He was living a pure and a clean life. They had nothing on him, nothing that would cause Daniel to be replaced, nothing that would warrant punishment from the king at that time. But then the light bulb goes off, and they say, we can't find anything against him. But this Daniel, notice how they say that Daniel, or this Daniel in those scriptures, and says this Daniel devoutly follows his God. He seems to strictly follow the law of his God. That's where we're going to make our move. We're going to find a way to use his walk with God against him. And you guys are probably thinking, well, this ain't going to work. But they didn't know that it was a dumb idea at that time. And I imagine that day when, when they said that, there were probably quite a few laughs up in heaven had at this thinking. Amen. These princes and rulers, they hatched their plan and they assembled themselves on Darius. And they say, King Darius, live forever. They come in, they start buttering him up. And all of us have consulted, the presidents, the princes, the governors, the counselors, and even all of your captains, King Darius, have consulted together. We've all came together to present and make this new royal decree. We want to make it a firm decree that if anyone asks a petition or makes a request of any god or any man in these next 30 days, save of you, O king, that he be put to death in the lion's den. Establish this decree now, O king, and let it not be changed. Sign it, and it cannot be altered. And to Darius, he's looking over this, he's like, Okay, this seems like a, a reasonable request. Everybody's got together. It seems like there's consensus. It's, this is a decent law, and of course, everybody has to come to me, so that's, you know, that's more power for me. So everything seems okay, and he puts his signature on it. You can picture one of the guys in the, green, uh, the background grinning, you know, rubbing his hands together, saying, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> they had it all worked out. Daniel's going to walk right into our little trap. There's no escape for him now because this law cannot be altered anyway. No man can change this law. But think about this scenario. 
Their whole plan revolved around Daniel being faithful in prayer. Imagine that being the only flaw that anybody in the world could find against you as that you prayed too much and you were faithful in your prayer. In the heart of Babylon, in the king's own court, Daniel managed to live a pure life in the midst of all that sin, in the midst of all that temptation. He managed to keep a faithful prayer life and a faithful walk on that straight and narrow path. And he had to do it without the Holy Ghost inside. So we ask ourselves sometimes, what's our excuse? If Daniel can do it back then without the Holy Ghost, why can we not do that today? And how do you expect to make it through the lines then if you don't have a solid relationship with God? Uh, Daniel 6 and 10 says, Now when Daniel knew it, talking about the decree, he knew it, it was signed. He didn't collapse in fear. He didn't break down. He didn't say, why me, God? He didn't begin to question God. He went home. He prayed, and he gave thanks to God three times a day. The Bible says just like he did a four time, just like he did every other day. He went and prayed and gave thanks to God. Three times a day he went and prayed before Nebuchadnezzar had his first dream. And then after Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, and Daniel interpreted it, and he was promoted to be governor of Babylon. What did he do? He continued to go to his house and pray three times a day. He prayed and thanked God before the writing was on the wall, and he continued to do it after the writing was on the wall, and he became the number three man in all of the kingdom. He was faithful to God, and God was faithful to Daniel, and he walked closely with God in the good times when all the blessings were to be had. But now the bad times have arrived. The king has essentially just signed Daniel's death warrant. And right here is where you might suspect that someone would give up. Serving God is about to cost him his life. And, and in churches, we've seen it many times before, many people have walked away from far less than that. You know, because something smaller than that comes up against them. They walk out those cho church doors. But Daniel continued to remain faithful. He served in the good times. Now it was time to serve in the bad times. His enemies uh, gathered and began to spy on him, praying. They, they said, we're going to watch Daniel. We're going to catch him praying. And this is where we're going to get him. And they sat there and they watched him and they waited and saw as he made request after request before God. But what they didn't know is they weren't the only ones watching Daniel remain faithful in his prayer life. While they rubbed their hands together and knowing Daniel's punishment, God was looking down. And this is where I picture God being like, you know, one of those proud parents. He's like, do you see Daniel? The king just signed his death warrant, but he's still praying. Me. Gabriel, Michael, y'all come over here and watch it. That's my boy right there. Look at what he's doing. In the face of death, he continues to pray and make requests of me and give thanks unto me. When the bad times come, are you going to remain faithful like Daniel? And we're in bad times now. Are you remaining faithful to watching these services like you were faithful to church before the pandemic hit, when the church doors were actually open? Are you staying faithful in your prayer and your fasting and studying the word? Are you remaining faithful in your righteousness and your holiness before God? Now is not the time to let things slip. Now is not the time to let the enemy see your flaws and see your weaknesses because when he's out there hunting, when a lion goes out there hunting, and many, many other predators go out there and hunt, they're not looking to take on the leader of the pack. They're looking for someone who's weak, and they're looking for someone who's a straggler, who was following behind, who cannot keep up with the leader, and that's the ones that they want to pick off. And like we read earlier, the devil is out there like a roaring lion. So if you're straggling, you're just making yourself an easier target for him to pick off. Now the princes have their evidence, and they're like, hey, King Darius, didn't didn't you recently sign some sort of bill or some sort of law into it, something about making petitions to, to a god or a man other than you, O king, and that anyone that breaks this law, isn't there some sort of punishment like going to the lion's den? Isn't there something that you just signed? And there he is, was like, yeah, guys, I was there. You were there. I put my signature on it. Everybody watched me put my signature on it. I signed this law that anyone makes that request, they'll be cast into the lion's den. And they said, well, you see, Darius... There's this Daniel, a captive of Judah, and he has no regard for you, and he has no regard for your decree. Every day he goes home and prays three times a day. And the Bible says when the king heard this, he was sore, displeased, that it hurt him, that he knew Daniel's fate was sealed. But then it says he set his heart 
on trying to deliver Daniel. He worked until sundown trying to find some way to get Daniel out of this, but he couldn't because that law could not be changed. And those princes, all Daniel's enemies kept reminding him, you cannot change this. This is the law of the Medes and the Persians. It cannot be altered. And so he has Daniel thrown in the lion's den. As, uh, you can just picture him eat up with grief. Brother Dwayne talked about Wednesday about, you know, being tossing and turning and having the sweaty feet. I bet, you know, King Darius was just drenched all over. But he cast Daniel lines in, but before he leaves, he calls out something. Daniel 6 and 16 says, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver you. Don't worry, Daniel. I've heard all about your God. I've heard all about that living God and that you are faithful to him. And that God is going to be able to bring you out. This man isn't even a Jew, but even he knows the one true God can deliver someone out. So they roll the stone back and they seal the entrance. The press, the king returns back to his palace. He, he fasts that night. He can't sleep. They, he doesn't even have any music brought in to soothe him or try to put him to sleep. And he's wondering... If each minute that passes by, if this is the time that Daniel is being ripped apart by all of these lions, and wondering why I signed such a stupid law to put my friend Daniel in this predicament. But when the morning comes, he rises early and he runs to the lion's den. Daniel 6 and 20, if you can leave this up for a minute, Brother J.B. And it says, and when he came to the den... He cried with a lamentable voice. That means he cried with a mourning voice, a sorrowful voice unto Daniel. He said, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Like I said before, Darius wasn't a Jew. In Babylon, they had many idols they served, but uh, there was one called Marduk who was the chief, and some scholars say that every year the kings in Babylon had to present themselves to this statue of Marduk year after year because that's how important he was. He was so ingrained in society. He was the top dog. He was the main little G God of that time in Babylon. But notice in this scripture, he's not calling on his God for help. He's not asking if his God can do anything. He's not saying, oh, Marduk, deliver him. He's not even thinking about him at this time. He's talking about the living God. He says, oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. Daniel, <coughs> excuse me, the God of Daniel was going to be able to deliver him. He's asking, was he able to deliver you out of this lion's den? And this in itself is a testament to Daniel's walk. Not only is he delivered from the lion's den, but his walk has also made him a light to King Darius in this situation. Darius worshiped at the altars of false idols. He didn't know God like Daniel knew God, but he's heard of him. Like Brother Thomas uh, talked about a couple weeks ago uh, about Paul being in captivity, and even though it's not in the Bible, I still believe it too, that even in captivity, he was there witnessing to everyone that he came in contact with, even his guards in Rome, and also believe Daniel was not silent about his God. I doubt there are many people around him that did not hear about the one true living God, because somehow the king had to know about this living God that he keeps referring to. When faced with this dire situation, none of the handful of gods that Darius had came to mind when he was wanting someone to rescue Daniel. No little G God of this world had the reputation of being a deliverer, but there is one that had that reputation, and that was the living God. He has the reputation of bringing people out of impossible situations. He's the one that people have heard about that brought out the three Hebrew boys from the fiery furnace. If he can save Daniel from the fire, surely, or I'm sorry, the three Hebrews from the fire, surely he can save Daniel from this lion's den. And like I said, because of Daniel's walk, he's delivered not only that, now Darius knows, and he's about to see the power of the living God himself. Daniel 6, 21 through 23 says, Then said Daniel, O king, live forever. And imagine the weight that comes off Darius at this point. He hears Daniel calling out. He's like, he made it. And 22 says, My God has sent an angel, has shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me for as much as before him, 
innocency. That means Daniel was pure. He had purity about him. Purity and innocency was found in me. And also before the old king have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in God. <clears throat> I was pure. I was innocent before God and before you, O king. And because I believe in God, he sent an angel and shut the mouths of the lions. But the story doesn't end here. Daniel was delivered from the lion's den. Now he's about to be delivered from the lions who are roaming around in the king's court itself. So the king gathers all of Daniel's accusers and their families, and now they're the ones tossed into the den of lions. Except this time, there's no angel standing by for them. And you've heard us mention this so many times over the past few months. But here again is just a story of how one person who remains faithful to God can have an impact, can be an effective witness. Daniel 6, 25 through 28 says, Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which, <coughs> excuse me, his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Not only did the king hear and witness the power of the living God. Now all the people that Darius ruled, all that great kingdom at that time, are going to hear about the power of Daniel's God. One man's faithfulness has now led an entire nation to hearing the truth about the living God. I said at the beginning that sometimes God fights our battles for us, and he shuts the mouths of lions and our enemies, just like he did with Daniel. But then there are times that we actually have to get in there and do the fighting ourselves. Excuse me, we look at David, and one day he arrives at Israel's camp as Goliath is challenging the people. Yet again, day after day, no one accepted his challenge, and each day he defies the armies of Israel. He defies God's people. And he looks around as Goliath begins to call everyone out, and, and he starts to ask him you know, several questions. He's like, why is everybody scared? And then one of the things he says is, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This gets around and finally catches Saul's ear. And has David, Saul has David brought before him. And Saul doubts David because he's, he said, buddy, you're nothing but a kid. You're just a youth. There's no way you can stand up to this giant, to this Philistine. But David has a story to tell Saul. He says, one day a lion and a bear came and took a lamb from my flock. But I went after them, and I slayed one. And then one rose up against me, and I grabbed it by the beard, and I slew it. Now think about this. There's no guns going on here. This is just hand-to-hand -hand fighting with a bear and a lion. But David took both of them on in his youth. This Philistine that defies the armies of the living God shall be just like that lion and that bear. God delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from this Philistine. So we know the story. He refuses to wear Saul's armor because he hadn't proved it in battle. He goes and gets the smooth stones and then places himself on the battlefield and has this conversation with Goliath. If you can go to 1 Samuel 17, 48. <clears throat> excuse me. And I'll, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. And it says, It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He wasn't just running towards Goliath. David had to face the whole Philistine army by himself. He was running alone out there on the field, and he only had five rocks in his pocket. And there were thousands of Philistines, and he had five rocks. But that's how confident David was in God being his deliverer, that no matter what, God was going to deliver him out of that situation. While Israel was hiding behind him, they let one man, one man, one giant keep them terrified day after day after day. One man held back the army of Israel. But now one Israelite is running towards the whole army 
of the Philistines. David may have looked all alone on that day in the battlefield, but we know that he wasn't alone. We know that God always has his servants' backs whenever they go in the battle, that he helps deliver us. And while it may seem like you're the only one standing, you're the only one standing up to the, to the lines in your world or the lines of this world, you're never standing alone. And I'm beginning to close here. If you can go to 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 18. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Paul saying, I didn't have anybody with me. I was there all by myself. Everyone left me. And I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding or however the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. There are battles you're going to face that we're all going to face. There are lines roaming around there. They may be at work. They may be at school. And sometimes you may find them in your own home. But if you'll stand for God, he's going to deliver you time after time after time. Paul says, I fought beasts at Ephesus, but God brought me through. Daniel faced actual lions <clears throat> and God delivered him. Remember where your help comes from and remember where your deliverance comes. I'm closing with these uh, last two scriptures. You go to 2 Samuel 22 verses 2 and 4. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the trouble comes, call on the Lord, and he'll be able to deliver you from the lions every single Amen. time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we love you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you that our deliverer, you thank you, God, for that you're our Savior. We thank you that you can bring us out of the lion's den and that you're there with us in every battle that we have. Even though we may seem like we're alone, God, we know that you're always there standing with us and strengthening us, God. We ask you to let this word go out, God. Let people apply this to their lives. Let them see that you are their deliverer, God. They need you on their side, that if we live holy and righteous, God, that you will bring us out of that lion's den just like you brought Daniel out. God, we thank you for your blessings, your mercy, and your grace, everything you've done for this church, God. God, we ask you to strengthen your church. God, bless the pastor and the elders and all the church members. God, help us stay united. God, help bind us together. God, help give him wisdom and knowledge and understanding and what to do in this situation. Give our leaders wisdom and knowledge and understanding. God, heal and save them. God, help us to all turn towards you. God, like we asked before, touch all those that are suffering from this virus, all those that have lost loved ones to this thing. You'd reach down and comfort them, God. God, and just speak that word of healing to get this thing out. God, we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. We give you all the praise and glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Church, I love you. Hope to see you soon. Remember, as the pastor says, stay saved and stay safe. God bless you.
the answer to it all. You wipe away your tears. You mend the broken life. You're the answer to it all, to it all. Once again, it's Jesus, I call you. Waymaker, miracle worker. Even when I 